Hi there, my name is Dr. Gerard Van Bell. I'm a astronomer at the Lowell Observatory, coming to you live here from Lowell Observatory here in Flagstaff, Arizona. And um, I want to say happy Earth Day. We are uh, going to be talking a bit about the uh, sorts of things that we're finding here at Lowell and in the astronomical community uh, at large. And one of the things that um, you may think about is, you know, astronomy is about looking up. And so what does that have to do with Earth Day? You know, basically the, 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 the ground beneath our feet here. So I was going to talk to you a bit about, you know, how this all kind of knits together. So let me start with showing you my screen. Here we go. And we're going to do some a walk about here basically and how looking up helps us look down. So my the uh, the thing that I wanted to talk about how you know good planets are hard to find. So one of the things that we are doing a lot of in astronomy light right now is looking for planets around other stars. And that search is something that has really been happening in earnest in astronomy over the past 25 years. One of the things that has been very exciting for me professionally in astronomy is right when I was starting as an astronomer, there, um, there were really no planets known around other stars. And when I was uh, finishing up graduate school, there were the first rumors starting to come out of uh, some, some big finds that had happened where, you know, uh, you know, perhaps there was a signal that was indicative of a, of a planet or another star. My, graduate advisor at the time, Mel Dyke, you know, he kind of poo-pooed it because he was saying, well, you know, there have been reports like that for many, many years in astronomy, and none of them have panned out. And so um, this is, uh, you know, obviously going to go away as well. Well, it didn't. And, and actually, over the last 25 years, we've gone from that first planet being detected uh, in, in, uh, in the sky orbiting another star to now we know thousands of them. And so yeah, so we have the science of astronomy and we're always looking up and we're studying the objects in the sky. This is a example of one of the telescopes that we use for that kind of work. This is a plane wave one meter telescope that we have at Lowell. And uh, yeah, we study the skies and we're able to actually study these objects in the sky, study stars in the sky at higher and higher resolution nowadays. Um, and so for example, we can look at individual stars and we can see features on their surfaces. There are spots on stars, just like we have spots on the sun. Uh, this is an image by uh, Rachel Rottenbacher at, uh, uh, she was then at Michigan, but she's at Yale now. Uh, this is using the Chara interferometer uh, just above Los Angeles on Mount Wilson. And we can measure very, very small things like this. So uh, this object, you know, would be roughly the same size as a orange in New York City as seen from here in Flagstaff. So we're, we have incredible tools that let us find uh, very small details. And we've been able to study stars and we can even study young stars and look at stars that um, are basically in the process of getting born. And one of the things that we see is that many stars have these disks around them. And we think that these uh, disks are you know, remnant material of the star formation process and planets form out of that disk. So uh, here's a telescope called ALMA that imaged something nearby, uh, an object called HL Tau. It's a, it's a star in the constellation of Taurus. That's why the Tau is there. And at, um, at high magnification, we see this, you know, this concentric ring structure that, or that is about the central young star. And it's thought that uh, we would have basically a flat disk around the star, but that carving out channels in that disk are these young baby planets. For this object, we can't actually see those young baby planets yet, but we can see the, the wake left in their tail uh, behind them as they, as they you know, churn around in orbit around their, their host star. With looking at stars at greater detail, we do actually have stars that we find planets around. This is an example of this, of a, a star called TRAPPIST-1 that uh, was uh, the host of seven planets that we have found orbiting this particular object. This is a very interesting star because this is 
a very, very small star. In fact, it's so small, it's on the boundary of what we would think a star is. You know, it's still big enough to have nuclear fusion taking place at the center of the star, but it is uh, just barely there. Uh, and so if you actually look at this and you can see um, its size here relative to the sun, it's actually much, much smaller than the sun. In fact, it's much more akin in size to Jupiter than to the sun. In fact, the entire TRAPPIST-1 system, you can see how these orbits are laid out here. If you were to put it right where the sun is located, it would all be well inside the orbit of Mercury. So we're finding planets around other stars, but you know, what are these planets like and what are these stellar systems like? Um, we, uh, in addition to finding planets that are very, very close in, uh, we have other techniques that let us find planets very, very far out. Um, so here, for example, in the upper left, there is an image of this star called HR8799. And these four objects, B, C, D, and E, uh, have been found around the star. And so this is actually a special type of camera that pushes away, that suppresses the starlight at the center of the, uh, at the center of the image so that you can see faint things next to the star. And so in this particular case, these other objects were found around it. And, and they're very far out in this case. They're actually not close like the Trappist system. They're very, very far away from their host star. Um, the scale here, uh, you can see this bar here that says 20 AU, that's astronomical units. A astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And so this one here, for example, E, looks like it's about one of those bars away from the center here where the starlight's getting blotted out. Um, and so that's about 20 AUs away. And these things, these other things are much further out. You know, this uh, object B here is, you know, looks like it's about 150 AU away. The extent of our solar system uh, from center to edge is about 40 AU. Uh, so from the sun out to the most distant objects like Neptune or Pluto, that's about 40 AU. Uh, our favorite little spacecraft here at the observatory is New Horizons, which you may recall flew past uh, Pluto in 2015 and took images of that world. The, um, New Horizons spacecraft just about a week ago crossed a milestone where after roughly 15 years of, of high speed travel, it just crossed the 50 AU mark. And so that's very, very far out. Uh, and these other images in this, in this uh, frame as well show bodies that again are uh, many tens uh, of AU away from their host star. So we're very good at, with the techniques that we have at our disposal in astronomy, we're very good at finding planets that are very, very close in, and we're good at finding planets that are very, very far out. And we're also very good at finding planets that are very, very big. And so we actually have enough planets that we have uh, measured their radius for, their, their, their physical size, and even have an estimate of how much they weigh, what's their mass that we can come up with a plot like this where you can kind of see a trend here from the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn down to the ice giants here. There's even a whole category in here of planets for which we have no analog in our own solar system, namely the super Earths. And these are things that you know, are between about two and a half and 10 times the mass of the Earth. And they're about uh, one and a half to three times the radius of the Earth. And then way down here in this corner of the plot is you know, the two planets in our solar system that fit this box are, are Earth and Venus. And there are very other blue dots here. There are very other few other things because uh, we found very few things that are the size of Earth around other stars. And so does that point to a lack of planets that are at that size? Well, Actually, no, what it points to is a lack of capability. So while the community over the last 25 years has gotten quite good at finding planets, finding the small planets is very hard. And that kind of makes sense. The, the big things are the things that are gonna stand out first and going to be most detectable by the techniques that we have. And in fact, this right-hand plot shows the mass of the various planets that have been detected 
as detections have happened over time. And so you can see that kind of this lower edge of this plot has drifted downward over the last 25 years or so, but we've had not so much luck in really pushing that down even further over the last 10 years. We've only found a few things that are Earth size or smaller. And on the left-hand side of this plot, what this shows is the various techniques that we have at our disposal. There's techniques such as the transit technique, where if the planet is orbiting its host star and it happens to pass between that host star and our line of, line of sight, you can see a little dip in brightness. And if that dip in brightness repeats on every orbit, you can measure the period of the orbit. The amount of the dip lets you measure the size of the star. And so that's the transit technique. Um, there is a radial velocity technique where we basically measure the speed of the star. And this, the, basically the planet that is orbiting the star will tug on its host and it'll tug it a little bit away from us when it's on the back side. And when it comes towards the front side, it'll tug it a little bit towards us. You can actually measure the change in the velocity of the star at a sufficient level of precision to detect a planet. And each one of these techniques, the transit technique in green and the, the radial velocity technique in blue, has sweet spots on how, how good they are at detecting things. So for example, this transit te technique, when you're banking on the fact that the planet is going between your line of sight and the host star, it helps if the planet is close in, because then it's much more likely that it just happens to line up and not have the orbit in such a way that you don't get that little eclipse every orbit. And so that's why these green points are pushed on the left-hand side. These are the short period orbits. Long period orbits are very hard to catch because for a long period orbit, you have a big wide orbit, and the likelihood that it just happens to line up just right is much, much lower. So on the flip side, the radial velocity technique, if you're looking for something tugging on its host star, it helps if it's big. And so that's why most of these things up here in the kind of the center top of the plot, those are radial velocity techniques. Um, for things that happen to be smaller but orbiting faster, we can still use radial velocity. But notably, if we plot our own solar system on here, in particular, you have Venus and Earth right here, and even further down the list, you have Mercury and Mars. These are in a desert of detections relative to stars, planets around other stars. And it doesn't mean that there aren't planets there. It just means that the techniques that we currently have don't get that far down. It's very hard to tease these sort of signals out uh, and see the planet amid the other sort of noise signals that you might have there. Here's another plot of kind of the same thing. This shows two state-of-the-art space missions that um, the red one, Kepler, is something that flew for uh, about uh, uh, eight years, starting in 2000, those late 2000s. And these are all the red dots. Uh, we have another mission called, which has been called WFIRST, recently renamed to the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. And uh, the relative areas of sensitivity you can see cut out off of this plot of the planet mass versus how far away it is from its host star. And you know, even the most advanced space observatory that we're going to fly, which hasn't even flown yet, this, these blue dots and this blue line, is going to just barely get into the region of where we can detect things that are like the Earth and like Venus. So it's, uh, it's merely a selection fact that uh, we haven't found things like uh, Earth or even Venus or Mars around, around other stars. The star signals themselves have all kinds of noise. I figured I'd throw this plot in here showing you that you're trying to look for a very subtle signal that's associated with the planet, for example, but the star is doing all kinds of other stuff too. So if you're trying to, for example, with the transit method, see this little dip in brightness of the star, um, the star itself is varying in brightness all over the place because it has spots that are rotating in and out of view and they may pulsate and there are flares that happen on the star. Our own sun uh, just over the last couple of days had some flares where it blew off some material. And so that makes the star brighten up a little bit. And so you may see a change in brightness that you're like, oh, that may be as a planet. But then you realize, oh, it doesn't happen in a repetitive sense or uh, there could be other things wrong with the signal. And so you might get things that hint at there being a planet there, but then with further analysis, 
uh, you find that it's maybe not the case. And so stars are not terribly cooperative when it comes to trying to tease out the details of their environment, potentially planets in that nearby environment to the stars themselves. So if we look at the surveys that have happened, this is a plot that I wanted to basically just show this left-hand side of the plot. Um, we can see the planetary detections. And so this is a function of radius versus period again. So how long does it take for the planet to go around? These different shades of blue show how complete the surveys are. We can actually mathematically model the techniques that we're using. And for every planet that we do find, we can actually come up with an estimate for how many we don't see. And what's interesting about that is um, we can also estimate the completeness, how, how likely it is that if there was a planet, for example, in this region of, of orbital period and its size, would, how likely would it be that we would see it? So uh, the Earth is really kind of in the lower right-hand corner of this plot. It's really in the region where, you know, even if we trained our best telescopes on a, on a star right now, the likelihood that we would see that Earth there uh, is still, you know, less than 10%. Um, what's interesting to me about this plot is that the detections we do have, the red dots, they only seem to kind of get more and more dense. There seems to be more and more of them as we move down to the lower left of this plot until this completeness effect really cuts off. So what that tells me is there's probably a lot more red dots to be found as our completeness numbers improve, as we push that downward in this plot. Um, I think we're going to find a lot more stuff. Uh, but uh, we just haven't seen it yet because our techniques have not been good enough. Once we do find planets, one of the things we want to do is characterize them. So, you know, it's not just stamp collecting. We're not just trying to figure out, um, you know, is there something there and then kind of file it away in some catalog somewhere and then wander off. We actually then want to know, you know, what's the nature of this planet? What's it like? And in particular, in astronomy, we talk about a concept called the habitable zone. Um, this is a off often maligned concept because it's pretty sloppy. But all this means when we talk about a planet potentially being in the habitable zone is what's its temperature? What, what do we think its temperature is going to be? Is it going to be a place where if you have water at this planet, is the water going to be gas? Is it going to be ice? Or is it going to be liquid? So you have three choices here. If it's too hot, you're going to get gas. In fact, that's the red part of this plot here. If you have something that is going to be uh, too cool, you're going to have uh, a lot of water ice. You may get other gases like hydrogen. And um, hydrogen can exist as a gas even at very, very cool temperatures. And so you'll be in the kind of this brown zone. But if you're in the area where potentially any water that was on this uh, planet you detect would be the right temperature to be liquid, then we say this is the habitable zone. What's really imprecise about this language is it uh, doesn't make it clear that we don't know if there's water there or not. Uh, we just know that, or we think, we think that if there was water there, it could potentially be liquid. But it doesn't actually mean there's, there's liquid there. And more importantly, habitable zone does not mean uh, inhabitable or inhabited uh, does not mean that we actually are guessing that um, you could support life there or that there even or that or more importantly that there is life there. It just means that water, if it was present, could be at this mag magic temperature where it's liquid. And so for the things that we've seen that are in the neighborhood of the size of Earth and Venus, um, that's these dots here. And again, we have these detection techniques that I've talked about. We've seen very few that are in this size range and even fewer that are in the correct temperature range that we potentially think. So this is something that uh, is of importance in trying to figure these things out. I started off talking about the TRAPPIST-1 system. So I want to circle back to that. This is seven planets that are going around this host star, and we can compare how much heat they are getting from their host star. And we can look at that and we can think about, um, well, 
what is going to be the average temperature of these stars. So even though these stars, uh, as I was saying at the, the top of the talk, um, are uh, even though these planets are, are orbiting their host star very close in compared to the linear distance of our own solar system, that star is small and it's not really strong. The smaller stars are a lot fainter and they give off a lot less uh, radiation, a lot less energy. And so being that much closer in, there actually is a range of these planets that are in this habitable zone again. So in blue, uh, is the smear that calls out what the habitable zone is thought to be for the solar system. So that includes Earth on the one side, Mars on the other side, maybe Venus just on the edge of the habitable zone. But uh, for TRAPPIST, we have the planets ordered from uh, closest to the star to furthest from the star. And here we have three, maybe four of them that are in this Goldilocks zone where we think that the overall average temperature of the planet because of its warmth from the star uh, is gonna be in the range where if there was water there, it would be liquid. So again, this highlights and betrays the concept of the habitable zone. So for example, Venus potentially is in the habitable zone, maybe based on this plot, but we know that Venus is a, at the surface of the planet is this hellhole of a planet where um, you know it's 800 degrees and hot enough to melt lead and this kind of thing. And that actually has actually very little to do with the relationship it has with the sun and has more to do with the fact that it's really good at trapping heat and it has this runaway greenhouse effect. And when astronomers talk about the habitable zone, they actually aren't thinking about that at all. Um, they're, they're just look, thinking about kind of very big, very round numbers of, you know, average amount of light that it's getting from the star and what on average should that probably mean for the temperature of the planet. And those sorts of concepts of, uh, you know, greenhouse effect and so forth usually aren't included in uh, ascertaining if something is in the, quote, habitable zone or not. In addition to trying to figure out how warm they are, something else that people are actually trying to work on is, you know, can we somehow figure out what the nature of these planets are? Uh, our own planet Earth has a, a, it's more like the one in the center here where we have a mantle, so kind of a crust on top of the planet, but then we have a, a core that is iron rich and a core that is kind of the, the heart of the planet. Uh, you can also potentially have planets that have no core or you can even have planets that have even more core, uh, but then have just uh, a whole bunch of water around them. So not only do you get water on the surface, but you get too much water, you get an ocean world. Um, and so uh, this is the sort of thing that people are trying to model and trying to figure out with TRAPPIST. Um, in the end, there are many implications of this. And this is what I think is important about this kind of work in astronomy is that it allows us to look at the Earth now through new eyes. And so what does that mean? First of all, I think an important question that is fun to ask is, is the Earth unique? And the, the straight up quick answer is we don't know yet. Um, we don't know that because as I was mentioning earlier, um, we're not very good at finding things exactly like Earth. We've gotten pretty good at this game of finding just planets around stars, but finding smaller planets that are further away from their host, um, we're still trying to crack that nut. So my own view on this and what I've seen so far is, you know, we've gone from a situation where when I was in grad school, we didn't know of any planets for sure around any stars to now we know that um, it is statistically likely that any star that you look at in the sky has at least one planet going around it. I can't tell you what kind of planet that is, but it's statistically likely that it's going to have some kind of planet going around it. We have numbers from spacecraft surveys of, of planets and finding stars around those planets that tell us that that is the general tendency of stars is to have planets. And that connects very well with the, the, the story we've been learning about how stars are born that I showed a little slide of earlier of, you know, it's expected that all stars form out of these big balls of gas and dust. And when they collapse, you get this disc around the host and that, that disc is gonna give you planets. That's the general 
picture of star formation that we think is prevalent throughout the universe. And that general picture has a general characteristic, which is the young star has a disk and the disk is probably gonna give us planets. So we're getting good at that. Um, and we're starting to look in the right places, but we still have to figure out if the, the earth is unique. My best guess is that we're gonna have loads of places like earth throughout the universe. Uh, and so that um, the, the, the things that are about the size of earth that are about as warm as earth, um, that we're gonna find tons of those kinds of things. Now, that always then of course, unfortunately brings up the, the co concept of, well, can we go there? And the short flat answer is no. <laughs> Exoplanets, we're very good at remote detection of these things. We're very good at building telescopes, but we have yet to invent warp drive. I don't see any prospects for inventing a warp drive. And what that means is that we can't go there. We may be able to see them, but unless something different happens in science that is really, you know, would make the upheaval of the last century with new things like quantum mechanics that gave us computers and general relativity that gave us GPS. Um, unless we have something really change in science, we're not gonna find a way to get them in any short order. So, you know, exoplanets are not destinations. That question is moot. Um, so exoplanets are special to learn about, but uh, you know this is not something to think about. And it's 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 actually an important point to make as we think about uh, our own planet here on Earth Day, which is you know the the common phrase is you know there is no planet B, and we may find tons of planets out there, maybe even find some that potentially look like they could support life and even even show signals of having that life, um, but. Uh, you know, that's something that we will do from afar. We won't be able to go there. Now, one of the most special things I think that science and astronomy have given to us culturally over the last 50 years has been an appreciation on, you know, the earth is a very, very special place. And so a very special island in the universe. This, uh, this uh, sort of photo has been repeated a number of times called Earth Rise, of seeing the Earth from the moon. And the, the Earth is a, a unique blue marble in space, and it's a fragile blue marble in space. And so I think one of the things that um, we have learned is that as we find more planets around other stars, uh, we find that even if the Earth isn't absolutely unique, we have a deeper appreciation for how special it is and how, uh, how, you, how, how special these sorts of places are in the universe and how we have to take care of them if, if they're in our responsibility. I do wanna point out that uh, there are ideas on how we can you know, move off planet and uh, take this special gift of life that we've found here on earth and take it into our solar system. Uh, I saw a great movie over the last, um, over the last weekend talking about settlements in space. Uh, you can go see it yourself if you want, the highfrontiermovie.com. It talks about initial ideas on how we could move into our immediate solar system and bring life from Earth to settlements in space. Um, and I think that this is actually something that will happen eventually. Um, there are too many people who are too interested in this kind of thing. And what I like about this concept and what I like about some of the motivating factors for this concept is that it is born out of an appreciation of how unique life is on earth and how uh, it would be a good thing to move some of the burden of that life off planet. Importantly, you could also think of the fact that this sort of expansion into our solar system could then let us move the industrial base off of Earth and keep the Earth as a park, keep the Earth as you know, the cradle from which we were born, something that is special to all of us and keep it more pristine than it already is. So with that, I am happy to take questions. I thank you all for tuning in and uh, listening about how you know, we have been finding planets for other stars and how that gives us a uh, perhaps an improved appreciation of our own planet here orbiting the sun. So,
been enjoyable to have you here. Um, we uh, have a question coming in. I see this in the chat window. And while we do that, I'm gonna go back to this very nice picture of the earth rising over. So here's a question. So will we have a way to detect water on exoplanets? So there's a lot wrapped up in that question. Um, the One of the strategies that NASA has been employing at Mars has been um, follow the water, try to find if there was water there, try to find um, if there currently is water there. The reason for that is any place here on Earth where we look for water and find water anywhere, uh, we generally find life, all kinds of crazy life, even water trapped in ice sheets underneath the Antarctic that don't get any direct sunlight. You do you know, samples through the ice there and pull up some of that water and they find microbes down there. Um, you look at water at the bottom of thermal vents and you know, at the bottom of the ocean that are you know, super, super hot and they find, uh, back, you know, they find bacteria there as well. So generally speaking, water does seem to be a pretty good uh, mile marker, a very good signpost for the possibility that you're gonna find life. So the question is, will we be able to detect water in exoplanets? So one of the things that we will do with uh, the biggest telescopes on the ground and some of the biggest telescopes in space is we're going to be getting better and better at looking at these planets around their host stars and directly getting light from the planets themselves. And when you do that, you can take that light and you can analyze it. One of the thing, one of the, the standard tools in the astronomer toolkit is to take that light and, and spread it apart into the blue light up to the red light and all the colors in between to spread it out into a spectrum. And when you do that, um, you can actually find in those spectra, you can find the fingerprints of molecules. You can find uh, indications with certain amounts of colors that are present or not present in the spectra that we have found corresponds to certain kinds of molecules. And so one of the ones that we can look for is water. And so we should be able to uh, characterize how much water we potentially have in these extrasolar planets. We, in addition to that, um, there's a lot of work that's going into trying to uh, very finely model the overall atmospheres from those spectra that we may find with these exoplanets. And that includes not just water, but say, let's measure how much uh, carbon dioxide is there. Let's measure how much nitrogen is there. Um, in the fairly young field that we call astrobiology, there is a lot of work in trying to determine what sort of signals we may see that could be uh, markers for life. So are there any molecules that exist in the atmosphere of a planet that um, shouldn't be there only if maybe there is life there? And so there's a few molecules like methane that people think uh, are potentially connected to biological processes. Uh, methane, for example, um, if you have methane gas in an atmosphere and that star is orbiting its host, the, sorry, that planet is orbiting its host star, the, uh, the propensity for light from the star to break methane down means that you shouldn't see a lot of methane in any planet's atmosphere. And the sort of thing that replenishes methane is life, is biological processes. And so if you look at an atmosphere and you spread it out into its spectra, uh, from some planet that's orbiting another star and you see a lot of methane there, maybe that's an indication that there's life there. <coughs> Let's see, another question here. Does Mars have clay resulting from the presence of ancient water flows? Uh, I'm not sure. I think so. Um, I, I, the, the studies of Mars are a little outside my wheelhouse, but I thought that the indications were that um, if not clay, there were other sorts of indications uh, from looking at 
pictures of what the surface looks like from orbit and so forth, that uh, there was evidence of ancient water flows there. Um, there are actually questions, uh, I believe, that are circulating about, you know, are there uh, water flows that are happening presently with Mars? Uh, water by itself probably can't exist in the Martian environment as, as anything other than ice or a gas. But if you make water especially brackish, you know, put a lot of minerals in it, a lot of salts in it, um, that lowers the melting point. And so then you could potentially have water that can exist in a liquid form and flow. And I thought that there had been some evidence from orbiters where um, pictures were taken of various parts of the surface. And then days later, months later, years later, they did the same area again, and they saw evidence of change that looked like change caused by flowing water. Um, I'm not sure how old that information is or if there's alternate explanations that have gone into play for that yet. But uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of interesting questions about water on Mars, both ancient and maybe in the present too. Let's see, do I have any other questions here, Danielle? So no other questions. So I think that I've actually uh, stayed my time here as well. So I appreciate you all tuning in. I am going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, I appreciate you uh, checking in and uh, listening about my talk about Earth Day and Earth's place in the cosmos. And uh, I look forward to having you come to Lowell Channel next time as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>